Well, welcome back. My name is Jerry Clark, and we're continuing our study in Romans at Walden Community uh, Church. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say a hello to everyone, and for especially for those of you who are, have been sticking with us for the last few weeks in this study. And uh, we're about halfway done, and we're going to continue today. I, I did pull sort of an audible uh, because the lesson that we were supposed to do this week should have been done on Easter Sunday. It was an Easter lesson. So I skipped it and we've now gone to uh, lesson eight. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're following or uh, if you have a quarterly or a book or whatever else, but we'll be in lesson eight in uh, Romans chapter eight. Uh, I hope everyone's had a good week. It's been an interesting week as we uh, begin to see the beginning of the end as far as the lockdown is concerned. Businesses are opening up. People are getting out. Traffic has increased. Uh, people are now slowly going back to their favorite restaurants. And so we'll see where this goes within the next month or a few weeks. Um, for some of us, though, uh, it's more like the end of the beginning rather than the beginning of the end. Uh, if you are my age or older or have a pre-existing condition like a lot of people have, you probably haven't changed your behavior a lot. Uh, you're not rushing out to your favorite restaurant or grocery store or whatever else. Uh, you may still be wearing your mask or gloves or uh, staying at home a lot more and doing the online shopping like we do. Uh, who knows what is going to happen to our society or our culture as we move on from this um, within the next few months, the next year. Uh, we may still be uh, doing some social distancing or other protective measures uh, because of this virus. And I would imagine a lot of us, until there is a, uh, a shot that uh, we can take uh, for this virus, we'll continue to be careful. I thought it was really interesting, um, over a number of years, uh, you know, watching TV, and, and we were stationed in Korea for a couple of years, every winter, you would see the Asians coming out with their mask and they would have their mask on uh, to protect them or prevent them from getting the flu or the cold or whatever was going around at the time. And they were always white. And I never thought anything about it until we began to see them being worn in the U.S. And American entrepreneurship is, is wonderful because within 48 hours, we had made wearing a mask a fashion statement. I mean, you can go on Etsy or any number of other websites and you can get masks that uh, show your favorite sports team, uh, flags, um, you know, anything that you want, flowers, puppy dogs, birds, or uh, zombies, or whatever else you want to uh, have displayed on your mask. And so I, I think it's interesting that uh, we took something that for decades had been sort of ordinary and turned it into something extraordinary. I even decorated my mask when I have to go out and wear it. Uh, although I didn't put any sequence on it or anything else, I just put a phrase on it. I said, if you can read this, then you are too close to me. Back up. So, sort of short and sweet, but social distancing is what we need to do these days. Um, Romans chapter 8. Now, let me review that Romans stands as the clearest and most systematic presentation of the gospel in all of the scriptures. Paul wrote it to the Romans in a time of peace for the Romans. However, within the next few years, they would be under tremendous persecution. And we've been going through 
the different chapters, sort of surveying different things in the book of Romans. And we have discovered that, you know, Christianity means a new position in relationship to God, uh, a relationship of peace, uh, a relationship of access, of hope, of, uh, you know, not uh, being consumed by God's wrath. Uh, we are, again, as we talked about last week, free from the power of sin because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. We are no longer beholding to sin or bound by sin. We are dead to sin and alive to God. So Paul has been doing this step-by-step -step, uh, approach to the gospel for the Romans and for us today, showing and building upon each thing that uh, says who we are and what we are to do as Christians. Because now that we have accomplished this new life, what does that mean and what do we need to do to grow or succeed as a Christians? Now, Romans 8, you know, is talked about as one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, primarily because it begins with a promise and it ends with a promise. If you look in chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. No condemnation. If you look in uh, verse 31 or 39, it says, Neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ our Lord. So bookends of promises and the things that are within these verses uh, are going to show us how great our salvation is and our walk with God is. Uh, let's begin in the fact that this chapter, as an overview, revolves around two possible ways to live. And what, do, what Paul does is contrast these two ways to live. One, you can live according to your sinful nature, which he calls the flesh, or you can live according to the Holy Spirit. And Paul makes this contrast very powerfully in verse 6 of chapter 8, when he says... The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. So you have two very stark contrasts here that we're going to talk about. And we're going to begin in verses uh, 12 and 13. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What Paul is saying here, you are not obligated to the flesh. Now, the word obligated is you are not bound by duty. You have no moral obligation. There is no strings attached to sin and you. They have been severed. They're cut. As we talked about last week, it's dead. Sin is dead to you. It's a, it's a different kind of relationship. One that you're not <clears throat> bound by any type of... Uh, duty or obligation to participate in. Now he says, we are not obligated to the flesh. Flesh is a word that Paul uses 26 times in Romans. 
And he uses it 13 times just in this single chapter 8. Now, what does he mean by the flesh? Well, he, he's talking about our physical nature, the physical nature of man, our earthly nature, which is apart from God's influence. In other words, it's man without God, man separated from God, therefore prone to sin. Now, as we talked about in verse 6, Paul contrasts two lifestyles, uh, living in the flesh or living by the Spirit, and he does this we're using a couple of different, uh, or, or using uh, two ways of saying uh, this contrast. He uses an if-then sentence in two places. He says, because if you then live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if then you live by the Spirit, you put death to the deeds of the body, you will live. So he says, if you then live according to the flesh, you are going to die. Well, what's Paul saying here? We all know we're going to die. That's a given. As soon as we're born, we're on the path to death. What kind of death is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about a spiritual death. If you live apart from God, you will spend eternity apart from God. If you make the decision to live your life apart from God in the flesh, God honors that decision when you die. But if you live by the Holy Spirit, now remember verse 6, the mind controlled by the Holy Spirit is life and peace. Now the NIV, which I'm looking at now, it says controlled. Uh, the verses that I read before says according to the flesh. Uh, one of the other uh, New American Standard uses set. The New King James Version says spiritually minded. If you live spiritually minded, you are going to put the death, put death to death the deeds of the body and you will live. And what it is, is this Holy Spirit, one has the possession of the thoughts and purposes in your mind. And uh, believers are able to put the sinful deeds to death because of the Holy Spirit working in us. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that for we were all baptized by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given the one spirit to drink. What Paul is saying here is that when we became Christians, we received the Holy Spirit. It's part of us. It is part of our being a new creature. We have within us the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at what that Holy Spirit does for us in these next few verses. But what, is, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, there's a number of verses in the Bible, but if you want to just look at a short list, there's a, you know, it's probably 20 different things that the Holy Spirit does for us. He teaches us. He guides us. He comforts us. He intercedes for us. He gifts us for service and a whole lot of other things. So we have within us the Holy Spirit, which is helping us toward a spirit of life and peace as opposed to death, spiritual death. 
Romans 8, 14 through 15. For all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, verse 15 is very important because it says, you receive the spirit of adoption. When you're adopted into a family, you have equal status with the other sons and daughters in the family. So what it's saying here is believers, because we are, have received the spirit of adoption, we've been adopted into God's family, we can, we enjoy the full status. It's not a status of uh, where you can do certain things and you can't do others. No, we have the full status as just as anyone else that is in that family. Uh, culminating in the fact that we can call God Father or Dad. Uh, Abba, Abba is an Aramaic word. It is not the uh, name of the singing group that came out of Sweden, I think. Now, their name is based on the first letters of their first names, A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. No, Abba is an Aramaic uh, word for father. In fact, some people or some translators uh, translate Abba father as, as uh, uh, written here as uh, father, our father, or father, dear father, connoting a sense of intimacy, uh, a sense of being in a family, of having brothers and sisters. In fact, you know, that's why in a lot of churches we'll address people as Brother Bill or Brother John or Sister Nancy or Sister uh, Karen or, or whatever else, because we are part of the family of God. Now let's look, continue on and looking at verses 16 and 17, because we're gonna be looking at a specific purpose of the Holy Spirit here. 16 and 17 says, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Um, not only does the Holy Spirit teach us, lead us, and play a significant role in our Christian lives, he plays a significant role in declaring our status as God's children. Because it says, the Spirit himself testifies together with us that we are God's children. And it's not a testament in addition to, it's with, you know, side by side. I am, I'm saying, I am a child of God. Spirit says, Holy Spirit says, yes, you are. I testify that you are. So as I was thinking about this, for some reason, I was thinking about uh, some of the laws that were given to the Israelites by Moses, or by God. And one of those was in Deuteronomy 19.15. which says, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, I don't know what brought me to that, but it was given by Moses in the law several times about 
needing two or more witnesses to condemn a man. It also, the Jews used it to say that you needed two or more to acquit someone. So if we have the Holy Spirit testifying for us that we're a child of God, that we belong to God, that we have been adopted by God, I, I had to ask myself, well, well, why? Why do we need the Holy Spirit testifying for us? Because that means that somebody has accused you of a crime in the spiritual realm. Now, who would this accuser be? I'll give you three choices and the first two don't count. One word, Satan. Satan, by his very name, is called the adversary or the accuser. Satan will always accuse us of not being good enough or being guilty of something or doing something that would separate us from God's family. Uh, and I know we've all had those thoughts, haven't we? Uh, and what Paul is saying here is we do not stand alone trying to defend ourselves. The Holy Spirit stands with us side by side, declaring that we are God's children and heirs to whatever God has for us, the great things that God has for us. We will be co-heirs with Christ. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. We're not going to stand before God and God says, oh, you know, I'm going to judge you based on your ability to be dead to sin or resist sin. Uh, no. If you look at Hebrews 8.12, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God is saying is that if you come to me and you repent and ask for forgiveness, I will remember your I will forgive you and I'll forget about it. In fact, in Psalms, one of the Psalms, it says, as far as the east is from the west. So this testimony of the Holy Spirit is not uh, in front of God. It is during those times when Satan is attacking us and saying, oh, Jerry, you're not good enough to be part of God's family. I saw what you did. I know what you said and go through a litany of stuff that makes me feel like that. I, you know, I'm, I'm hanging by a thread as far as being a child of God or getting into heaven, or whatever else you're trying to do. That's what's great, because the Holy Spirit says, don't listen to him. I'm testifying to you that you are a child of God. And I'm here to guide you, to teach you, remind you sometimes of things you need to do. And I'm here with you. So the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us alone to face all of Satan's barbs. He is right there witness, uh, witnessing for us against Satan. So whenever Satan is waking you up in the middle of the night and saying, oh, do you know what you did back when? Oh, you should feel so guilty about this. You should feel like you are not good enough, you know, and, and go through the litany of things that make us feel lesser than we are, you can say, wait a minute. I asked God to forgive me of that. I repented 
So that sin is no more. And the Holy Spirit will say, you're right. Don't let Satan say these things. It's the done deal. I'm testifying that you are an heir within God's family. You have been adopted. So I think that's a significant thing that we need to remember about the Holy Spirit in this verse. Romans 8, 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is coming or is going to be revealed to us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that we will receive. Wow. And what he's saying here is the struggles, the pain, the persecution, whatever else we have on this earth is not significant with the reward that is going to come. In fact, I like the way he says it in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. <laughs> it, it, momentary and light sufferings. Uh, I don't, sometimes I, sometimes I don't think my sufferings are momentary. <laughs> momentary means, wow, that quick. Or light. Um, but do you ever think about turning eternity? How long eternity is? especially when you compare it to our current lives. You know, we try to eke out 80, 90, maybe 100 years, but when you compare that to eternity, it is a small number. And when you look at suffering, I want you as a Christian to think of the worst thing that has ever happened to you. The words pain, the words crisis, uh, death of a loved one, a child, whatever the worst pain you had from an affliction or an event. Now I'm going to take a cup of sip of coffee here. Now, as a Christian, if you've thought of what that is, that's the worst pain you will ever feel. Because after your life is completed on this earth, you go to heaven, there won't be any more pain. It'll be joy. So we can consider our suffering momentary because whatever it is, ever, whatever how bad it is, it'll be gone. It'll be gone for eternity. Now, for a non-Christian, Life for the self, the flesh, self-flesh, in fact, if you say it, it sort of sounds like selfish, but if you live your life for yourself, the best or the happiest moment in your life, whether you win the lottery for millions of dollars, uh, you get a huge promotion, you're uh, CEO of the company or something like that, uh, you have a lot of power or a lot of money, that's going to be the best that will ever that you will ever have because there's not going to be anything for you to look forward to and when you compare that to eternity that's sort of momentary also so as a christian you have the hope and the joy of knowing you were adopted and great things as an heir in heaven are the great things that you're going to receive. Whereas a Christian, all you're going to get is what you get here. As a non-Christian, all you're going to get is what you get here. You have nothing to look forward to. Okay, verses 19 through 22. Oh. Moving into a little bit of a different 
statement here, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. It's interesting because as Paul talks about our suffering, the human suffering, which derived when Adam sinned and, and God cursed the ground, just as we have been living under this curse, so has the earth, so has the created order. Creation has been subjected to futility. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. Futility has a connotation of emptiness, not being able to fulfill its purpose. So even the earth was created for a purpose, and when sin entered the world, that purpose was thwarted. Nothing the earth could do could overcome that, just as nothing we could do could overcome that. For not only is our glory going to be revealed to us, God will set free creation itself. God, uh, creation will no longer be under bondage to decay, but will move into restoration. The earthquakes, the uh, hurricanes, uh, all the other things are part of the earth, the created order being uh, a subject of sin. Because in chapter three of Genesis, God cursed the ground, didn't he? So even the earth and really the cosmos has been pulled in to this. And if you look in verse 22, it says that, for we know that the creation, whole creation has been groaning with the labor pains until now. The whole creation. Now, I've never experienced it and never will, but my wife tells me labor is painful. And I've heard it from other places too. Uh, typical labor for a human is hopefully a few hours, although I'm sure there are those that uh, would say uh, it was a few days. But uh, anyway, we have to imagine that it is not a lengthy amount of time. Now, how would you imagine the pain of labor for thousands of years? Because the creation began these labor pains in chapter three of Genesis. But it will end in Revelations 21.1. Revelations 21 and 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So the hope that is to come is a hope not only for us, but for all of creation as well. And as it says in verse 823, not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits, we also groan with our, our, within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We even groan within ourselves. The best way that I can put that is getting old is not for sissies. 
I groan a lot more. I groan when I get up in the morning. My legs hurt, my back hurts, you know, lots of things hurt, except for my brain. My brain keeps telling me, oh, you can do this. Uh, you know, you can, you can run and jump and still do these things. But my body says, uh-uh, that, that's over. Because we're susceptible to the same decay and pain as the rest of creation. But Paul is saying, but we have the Holy Spirit as the first fruits. Or what does that mean? Well, I think he, he has a pretty good meaning in Ephesians. If I can find it here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance with the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. We have a sign of what is to come. Just as the first crops to be harvested were given to God, we have this Holy Spirit residing in us, helping us, guiding us, interceding for us, comforting for us as a deposit of our inheritance to come. As a deposit of our inheritance to come. If God would ever ask us when we die, why should I let you have into my heaven? You can say, hey, here's my deposit. <laughs> I became a Christian and I have a deposit, the Holy Spirit. Come on in. Paul described our adoption as the redemptions of our bodies in verse 23. He said, the redemption of our bodies. We're going to get a new body. Hallelujah. We will one day be free from decay and corruption. I will be able to get out of bed if we sleep in heaven. I don't know. Uh, I know there won't be any Chinese food in heaven because as soon as you eat Chinese food, you're hungry again, and there's not going to be any hunger in heaven. I'm not sure about Mexican food, though, but I hope it's there. Uh, anyway, one day we'll be free of death and decay. We'll have new bodies. Uh, hopefully slimmer, uh, but good. You know, I'd like to end this with a quote from D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was one of the greatest evangelists of the 19th century, and he said it this way before he died. Soon you will read in the newspapers that D.L. Moody has died. Do not believe it. For in that moment, I shall be more alive than I have ever been. Billy Graham said something similar, but ended it with, I have not died. I've just changed my address. So that's what we have to look forward to. We have our deposit. We have the Holy Spirit within us, testifying with us. What could be greater than that? Because nothing in this creation will separate us from the love of God. Let me pray you out of here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time we have together to study your powerful word. And knowing that once we become a Christian, we're not just left out there to figure out it for ourselves, but we have the Holy Spirit within us, guiding us, teaching us, doing all that it needs to do or he needs to do to bring us to your glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have received a deposit that we have been adopted, that we are heirs of great things. We pray now that as we go through this next week, we don't know what's going to happen. The virus is still around, things are happening, but I just pray that everyone watching and in 
and our families, that you will help us to be safe and well. Until we come back to study your word again. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.